Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to the February 4th edition of Liberal Viewer Sunday Live Clip Roundup, the 250th episode for the round number fans out there. Thanks for joining me. I picked out the weekend's 16 best, most newsworthy clips for what should be a really educational, informative, media criticism and political analysis show for you all tonight. That's fair use, media criticism and political analysis. Uh, the political comedy sources today will be both from last night's Saturday Night Live with Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump in the cold open and also a clip from HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher last Friday night. And as usual, the rest of my clips come from the Sunday morning news analysis shows from the Big Five cor corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News, the so-called corporate media here in the United States. You can see the big topic I'm covering uh, described down in the video description, uh, Trump versus FBI and justice, the release of this memo that uh, casts aspersions on the FBI and the Justice Department in terms of getting a uh, FISA surveillance warrant uh, against Carter Page, who worked for the Trump campaign. Oh, also, if you want to see the 16 clips, I'm uh, the list of my 16 clips that I refer to during the show. I put a link to that down in the video description. Uh, this is the second week in a row. You can also support my videos by making a direct PayPal donation to at paypal.me slash liberal viewer. Uh, but like I said, the big topic is the, uh, the memo that was released on Friday. And uh, I'm going to have pretty much all the clips are on that. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the cold open from... Uh, last, uh, so on Saturday Night Live's, uh, the beginning of the show, the cold open had Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump calling in to Fox and Friends. They did a parody of Fox and Friends, which is this, uh, Fox News morning show most of you know, uh, that is very, very, uh, uh, obsequious and, uh, they basically are big, big Trump supporters, as you'll see in the clip, and then, uh, as I, um, well, well, I edited two parts together here for you because uh, I wanted to uh, show the very beginning here where, where there was a good joke and then the part that are uh, specifically uh, about the memo uh, over here. Sir, it is such an honor. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Yes. I'm so busy, and you're all, if you're wondering why I'm so out of breath, it's because I'm doing my P90X morning exercises right now. <laughs> but I'm saving the economy, destroying ISIS, and right now I'm getting my daily intelligence briefing. Oh, uh, from who? From you guys. <laughs> Thanks so much, your show is so great. Huge ratings, of course, not as big as the ratings for my State of the Union speech, which was watched by 10 billion people, <laughs> including all of China. <laughs> now, they say there's only 7 billion people on Earth, so where the other 3 billion come from? Please. Illegals? I don't know. <laughs> but guys, this memo might be the greatest memo since the Declaration of Independence. I don't know. I haven't read either one of them, and... <laughs> Devin Nunes, I love that guy, my sweet little house elf. So close, so close to earning his freedom. His memo proves that the FBI is biased and they have a history of this, folks. Okay, a history. <laughs> biased against Richard Nixon. They were biased against John Gotti. Biased against Dillinger. Dillinger! I can't figure that out. And they're biased against me. Now, can I ask you all a question? Okay? Anything. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Whose State of the Union had 10 billion people watch it? Yours did. Who's the most innocent guy in the whole wide world? You are. One more time. You are. You are. You are. I can't hear you. <laughs> so... That's the obsequiousness that I thought was uh, well portrayed in the parody. Uh, I mean, not the best impressions for people who are familiar with Steve Ducey and the brown-haired guy who's not Steve Ducey, Brian Kilmeade, and certainly not a good Ainsley Earhart impression there. But 
uh, in general, the, the tone of Fox and Friends, I think, was replicated pretty well. And, of course, it's nice to see Alec Baldwin back as Donald Trump uh, as Saturday Night Live is about to take a one-month hiatus for the uh, Winter Olympics. Uh, but uh, that was not the only set of jokes about the uh, release of the memo on uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, the Weekend Update anchors also took on the topic, and uh, I was uh, going to show you... Ugh, I'm having such problems with the software. I'm trying to get the live stream working for the live viewer. Show you the weekend update clip with uh, Colin Jost and Michael Che making their jokes about the release of the memo uh, over here. President Trump authorized the release of a memo that claims the FBI improperly spied on his campaign, despite warnings from the FBI and the Department of Justice that the memo was inaccurate. Because if anyone's concerned with accuracy, it's Mr. 239 pounds. <laughs> this memo came from 40-year-old virgin Devin Nunes, who was chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. I gotta say, I don't really trust this guy to untangle a vast conspiracy. I wouldn't really trust him to untangle a pair of headphones. Now, I'm trying to put myself in his shoes, and it's pretty easy because his shoes are Velcro. But I don't really understand how any of this is important, so I'm just gonna treat this memo like every other memo I've received at work and completely ignore it. At this point, if you actually wanna get my attention, the bar is set at porn star spanks president with magazine. Also, this is a four-page memo that just cherry-picks information from a FISA document that's like 50 or 60 pages long. It's like when you see a blurb for Transformers 5, and it says, it blew my mind, when the full quote is, it blew my mind that God allowed this. First of all, you know damn well Donald Trump didn't read this memo. It's four pages long. And the only time Donald Trump reads four pages in a row is when he's ordering breakfast. <laughs> and to prove there's an actual clip of Donald Trump explaining the memo. But I think it's a disgrace what's happening in the country. And when you look at that, and you see that, and so many other things, what's going on, uh, a lot of people should be ashamed of themselves, and much worse than that. <laughs> Listen to him stammer. He sounds like Colin when I asked him if his family ever owned slaves. <laughs> Can we have this conversation off camera? <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I think the best part about the weekend update jokes is like the Colin Jost, uh, Michael Che banter there in between the jokes. But uh, I mean, some of those jokes there were okay. I mean, uh, I don't know. The writing just. Tina Fey actually ap appeared uh, in uh, a uh, football-related skit about the Patriots versus the Eagles. Apparently, the Eagles beat the Patriots. Uh, they were still... Uh, the game was still going on when I first started to try to do my show. Uh, that was like seven hours ago, and it's still... Uh, Xfinity Comcast is doing some work in my area. Or I don't know what's going on, but... I apologize to the live viewers who hung around because it, I'm not getting much of a live stream here. Uh, but uh, Tina Fey was in one of the skits, but apparently she didn't help write any of the jokes because I think uh, the jokes have not been as good since uh, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler left, especially Tina Fey as head writer. Uh, but I thought actually the jokes were much better in Bill Maher's monologue this week. Uh, and they showed like a much more detailed knowledge of the <clears throat> uh, memo and you know the background, and uh, I thought got to some of the some more of the issues that you'll actually see in the news clips that are going to come after this Bill Maher clip. Uh, here's uh, about two and a half minutes on the release of the memo from Bill Maher's monologue last Friday that I will talk about with you after we watch it together over here. Hmm? Ugh. Come on, play. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty with my software here. Things are like freezing up. Mm -hmm. I'm 
getting uh, a little turning wheel here. I'm trying. Let me see if I can. I might have to restart the whole show if I can't get this stupid. since before the election, uh, you know, it's supposed to make us think that our own top law enforcement people are crooked so Trump can get away with his Russia crimes. Mm -hmm. Problem is, the Republicans talk about this memo, you know, like it's some smoking gun piece of evidence that they uncovered. No, they wrote it. <laughs> they... <laughs> Uncovered it in their printer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not an intelligence document. It's, it's a Facebook post that you'd briefly skim before a clicking unfriend. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> the Republican, they did not like what the FBI was finding out about Trump. So, like the true patriots they are of Russia. <laughs> They attack the FBI and the Justice Department because they're biased. Yes, because they're in law enforcement and the Crump, Trump crime family commits crimes. So that's what they're supposed to do. It's like saying the exterminator is biased against the termites. <laughs> this... Pace myself. I know I get pissed off too early. <laughs> Uh, but, right? But don't you? I mean, this Republican delusion that Robert Mueller, a Republican who's there because of Trump, uh, is conspiring with Rod Rosenstein, the acting attorney general, a Republican who's there because of Trump, and, of course, Mueller's old buddy, Jim Comey, another Republican appointed by Trump. And, and Trump's attitude is, geez, what a bunch of, what a bunch of idiots. Who, 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 who put them in charge? <laughs> but, but... but okay, Smith in the Justice Department is not the only thing that fat Nixon was up to this week. <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep going through the fat Nixon joke. I like that. I also like the joke about uh, the you know, the exterminator being biased against the termites. And like I said, there were several facts interspersed throughout uh, that uh, series of jokes that I thought were more fact intensive than the jokes on Weekend Update. And uh, although there was one mistake in there, I noticed he said that uh, uh, he was going through all the officials who were Republicans appointed by Donald Trump, and he included James Comey, who... James Comey was not appointed by Donald Trump. He decided not to fire him when he first started and then later did fire him, but uh, he had been appointed previously. And uh, so that was, even though I was praising those jokes because uh, they were so fact-based, there was that factual error. Uh, and now I'm going to get to the actual news clips. I'm going to show news summaries from all five of the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, ABC, even though, uh, you know, ABC's been winning the news summary uh, competition for uh, most, uh, I think, at least two of the last three weeks. Uh, this week, I think, actually, NBC won because it had just the more detailed, uh, in-depth summary. But I still put ABC first here because ABC, actually, I've been thinking since Friday that the the main title of my video was going to be Trump versus FBI, or it turned out Trump versus FBI, comma, justice, question mark. And ABC took uh, almost the same title. It's uh, the Trump war on the FBI. And this is just a little bit over a minute, but it has most of the facts you'll see in the almost four minute NBC news summary that follows it. Which, and I'll discuss it with you after we watch together over here. Morning, President Trump ramped up his war on the FBI this week, signaling he'll do whatever it takes to discredit the Russia probe. He's already director, forced out a deputy, publicly attacked his attorney general, and threatened other officials behind closed doors. 
And it all broke open Friday when the president declassified that infamous memo from Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee. The president and his allies claim it shows that the FBI wrongly convinced a judge to approve a wiretap against a former campaign advisor, Carter Page, by relying on a dossier paid for by the Clinton campaign and by failing to disclose that funding. Democrats, whose own rebuttal memo has been blocked by the GOP, say that's simply not true. They're backed by a host of independent experts and this statement from the FBI. We have grave concerns about material omissions of fact that fundamentally impact the memo's accuracy. And that drew a fierce response from President Trump. The top leadership and investigators of the FBI and the Justice Department have politicized the sacred investigative process in favor of the Democrats. I want to start with our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thompson. Uh, and they, uh, to ABC, uh, to give ABC a little credit, they did have a more of a news summary. You saw Pierre Thomas, their justice correspondent there, gave a report back and forth with uh, George Stephanopoulos, which I'm not going to show. If you want to see the entire program yourself, there's a link down to all the sources of the videos I use in the video description, including ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Uh, and you've got the basic bare-bone facts of the release of the memo and uh, sort of the fallout, but uh, the much more extensive news summary was over on NBC's Meet the Press. Uh, you'll see this is uh, Chuck Todd. Uh, he starting off uh, with the hype about the memo because the memo itself was not, you know, I've also put a link to the four-page memo down in the video description. You can read that for yourself. And there's not that much there, and especially considering the hype that led up to the release of the memo, which is uh, what Chuck Todd starts off with here in his introduction. And then he goes to the video package uh, which uh, is, uh, the video package it starts with this clip where it sounds like Donald Trump might actually fire Rod Rosenstein. Uh, and I'll talk about that and the rest of the clip with you after we watch together over here. Sunday morning to a lot of people, the headline of the Republican memo was that it didn't live up to the hype, but that misses the point. The hype was the point. The pre-release campaign by President Trump's allies was aimed at discrediting the Russia investigation, no matter what the memo did or did not reveal. Yesterday, President Trump tweeted, quote, this memo totally vindicates Trump in probe. But does it? The memo does not make the case that the now famous dossier compiled by British spy Christopher Steele was the reason the FBI opened its investigation. Nor does this memo undermine much of what we now know about the Russia probe, from contacts between Trump family members and campaign officials with Russians, to President Trump's admission to Lester Holt, Director James Comey, because of, quote, this Russia thing. In fact, White House counsel Don McGahn wrote in his cover letter clearing the release of this memo for public uh, reading. To be clear, the memorandum reflects the judgments of its congressional authors. In other words, the White House counsel is saying this is essentially a political opinion piece. Still, many see President Trump using the memo either as justification or an excuse, depending on your point of view, to dismiss the man who oversees special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. You, you figure that one out. President Trump is not ruling out firing Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein after the release of a Republican memo which accuses senior law enforcement officials, including Rosenstein, of abusing their surveillance powers to spy on former campaign aide Carter Page, who they suspected was a Russian agent. I think it's a disgrace what's happening in our country. A lot of people should be ashamed of themselves, and much worse than that. The Washington Post reports that Mr. Trump has told aides that releasing the memo might give him justification to fire Rosenstein, who oversees Mueller and is the only person who could legally fire him. The White House is pushing back. We fully expect Rod Rosenstein to continue on as the deputy attorney general. The memo, which has been hyped by Trump allies for weeks, alleges the October 2016 application for the initial surveillance warrant relied on a dossier compiled by Christopher Steele, a former British intelligence operative. Four times they took this dossier and dressed it all up like it was some legitimate intelligence, not telling the court 
that it was paid for by the Clinton campaign. But Democrats on the committee dispute that, saying the FBI did tell the court that Steele's information was politically motivated. Also, Page had been on the FBI's radar since 2013 when Russian spies tried to recruit him. And the memo undercuts its own case, acknowledging that it was not the Steele dossier, but Trump campaign advisor George Papadopoulos, who triggered an FBI counterintelligence investigation into Russian influence in July 2016. Now, the campaign by Trump allies to push for the memo's release... Hashtag release the memo. Call the number on your screen, 202-224-3121. Tell Congress... ...has turned to Robert Mueller. The special counsel must be disbanded immediately. And by the way, nobody else will say this, all charges against Paul Manafort and General Michael Flynn need to be dropped. It's that simple. And House Intelligence Committee Chair Devin Nunes says there's more to come. We are in the middle of what I call phase two of our investigation, which involves other departments, uh, specifically the State Department and some of the involvement that they had in this. Joining me now for his first interview since... So, yeah, that's the best news summary from NBC's Meet the Press. Uh, I think it had plenty of clips. I, I like the video package that they prepare com combined with the most up-to-date up introduction, uh, you know, from Chuck Todd at the beginning there. Uh, it tends to be a winning format, even though ABC has won the competition most weeks. I think that's the best news summary, and I'm going to show all five, I mean, to the extent that they had news summaries. You'll see Fox News Sunday at the end didn't really have a news summary, but uh, that's because their bias machine was broken. I don't know. Uh, but the, well, I'll explain that when I get to it. But uh, next, uh, CNN's State of the Union also had a, a similar title as ABC, the, the war on the FBI, or, well, uh, it's actually Trump versus his own, his own national security officials. Uh, though, the State of the Union is ready for football. I guess Jake Tapper couldn't uh, stop himself from making a Super Bowl refer reference right at the beginning there. And then I have one criticism at the end. The, this uh, anonymous official they used to criticize uh, Trump, which I will discuss with you after we watch this 80-second clip together over here. Jake Tapper in Washington, where the state of our union is ready for some football as Americans wait for the Eagles and the Patriots to face off in the Super Bowl. President Trump is facing off with his own national security community leaders. The president spent Saturday golfing and complaining on Twitter that nobody's talking about his great jobs numbers, only Russia, Russia, Russia. He also used Twitter to declare himself cleared in the ongoing Russia investigation after the release of a Republican four-page memo alleging the FBI abused its surveillance tools during and after the 2016 election. He tweeted, quote, this memo totally vindicates Trump in pro, but the Russian witch hunt goes on and on. There was no collusion and there was no obstruction. The word now used because after one year of looking endlessly and finding nothing, collusion is dead. This is an American disgrace, unquote. In response to the president's tweet, a former senior national security official told me, quote, as a public servant, I was taught to never take official action for personal gain. That is exactly what our president has done. He personally ordered the declassification of the memo, not for political purposes, but for personal purposes. The proof of that is his claim that he has now been vindicated by the memo. In my view, this conflict of interest is the real story, not the memo itself, which doesn't contain much we didn't already know, unquote. Let's get right to the number two Democrat in the and I'll have a couple clips from Dick Durbin coming up. It looks like all of a sudden Xfinity Comcast has like turned on the internet again, and I've started broadcasting to the live uh, streamers. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, the first half hour, first 20 minutes of the show did not get live stream, but uh, I will upload the recorded show at the end. Uh, this has been a, a nightmare waiting for my... There's been some sort of... Uh, Something has been wrong with my internet for the last seven or eight hours so that I, whatever, I finally got to start the show and now it looks like I'm actually broadcasting the show, but I'm already uh, on clip number seven here, which is uh, the fourth of five news summaries about the release of the memo. Uh, this is the CBS Face the Nation uh, news summary about the release of the memo on Friday 
with the, I don't know, who's going to be, now that John Dickerson's gone, they, there was Nancy Cordes last week, this week is Margaret Brennan, uh, and she did a fairly good job, uh, and I don't know if the uh, guest hosts have any input into the structure of the show, but they actually did a new summary, uh, which, as I pointed out ma over many weeks, uh, CBS's Face the Nation doesn't do a new summary. It's only about a minute long, uh, but I will play it for you and talk about it with you after we watch together over here. The news cycle in Washington has been dominated this week by a four-page memo written by Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee asserting that the FBI concealed that it had used anti-Trump research funded by Democrats when it obtained a secret warrant from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance, or FISA court, to monitor a Trump campaign associate named Carter Page. He had already been on the FBI's radar due to past contact with Russian operatives. The anti-Trump research, also called the Steele dossier, was originally put together by a former British spy named Christopher Steele. The Republican memo also confirmed that the FBI investigation had begun in the summer of 2016 based on information about another Trump campaign associate named George Papadopoulos. He has since pled guilty and is cooperating with the probe led by special counsel Robert Mueller. Saturday, President Trump tweeted that the memo, quote, totally vindicated Trump in the Russia probe. We sat down earlier with South Carolina Congressman Trey. That's South Carolina Congressman Trey Gowdy, and I'll have a couple clips from him uh, coming up, as well as Adam Schiff, because they're two of the only members of Congress. There are a couple others that Trey Gowdy, Gowdy will talk about, but there are very few members of Congress who've actually read the FISA uh, warrant uh, request documents that went to the I mean, FISA stands for Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and then there's the FISC which is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that uh, they make applications to spy on people like Carter Page who they think are foreign agents there's probable cause that they uh, are uh, foreign agents and uh, apparently they prove that uh, to a court uh, four times and the question is whether they used, uh, improperly used the so-called steel dossier, as you saw in all those news clips. Now, Trey Gowdy, I'll show clips of Trey Gowdy coming up because Trey Gowdy and Adam Schiff actually read the, whatever, maybe it's 60 pages. And, you know, there's just this four-page memo now, but uh, there's usually many, many pages in a foreign intelligence surveillance court uh, warrant application. And Trey Gowdy read it all, Adam Schiff read it all, and I'll have... Uh, two extended clips from both of them coming up. Uh, but before I get to the uh, Adam Schiff and Trey Gowdy clips, I want to show one more news summary. It's a really brief news summary from Fox News Sunday, and then they let this Republican member of Congress sort of frame the issues. They, they don't really talk about... Uh, well, you'll see, I guess Fox News Sunday had some... Uh, technical difficulties this morning so they didn't show their little introductory uh, montage with the voiceover and they just started with Chris Wallace staring into the camera and saying uh, we didn't pay our electricity bill not really but we've got a problem and actually I can't really after all the problems I had getting my broadcast going I uh, I can't really uh, cast any aspersions on Fox News Sunday for that but I was thinking you know oh is, if, does that mean their bias machine is broken because that introductory montage is usually like one of the most biased parts of the show but uh, you'll see the that Chris Wallace does not give very much information at all about uh, how you know what's going on and the flaws in the memo and the big fight between Trump and his own FBI and then uh, to frame the issues he lets this Republican congressman uh, well I mean he he does say one or two things about the the Mueller probe that are good but uh, other than that he does get to frame the issues for uh, Fox News Sunday viewers in this uh, three-minute clip over here and hello again from Fox News in Washington well someone forgot to pay the electricity bill not really but we lost power to our studio overnight and with duct tape and bailing wire and a couple of hamsters running really hard we have jerry-rigged an operation to put on this program Keep your fingers crossed. 
The nation's capital is still arguing this weekend about that House Republican memo accusing the feds of abusing their authority to surveil a former Trump campaign advisor and suggesting there's politics at the center of the Russia investigation. We begin this hour with two members of the House Intelligence Committee. From San Francisco, Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell, and from Salt Lake City, Republican Chris Stewart. Gentlemen, now that we've seen the memo, the big question is, where does this leave the Robert Mueller special counsel investigation? Uh, here's a tweet that the president uh, put out this weekend. The memo totally vindicates Trump in probe, but the Russian witch hunt goes on and on. There was no collusion and there was no obstruction. The word now used because after one year of looking endlessly and finding nothing, collusion is dead. This is an American disgrace. Congressman Stewart, does the GOP memo vindicate the president? Does it end the need for the special prosecutor's investigation? No, it doesn't end that need at all. I think it would be a mistake for anyone to suggest that the special counsel shouldn't complete his work. I support his work. I want him to finish it. I hope he finishes it as quickly as possible. This memo has, frankly, nothing at all to do with the special counsel. It was one of the criticisms of people last week and before that who had never seen the memo who said, you know, this is to impugn the uh, integrity and the work of the special counsel, as, you've, as you know now, Chris, has nothing at all to do with that. They're very separate. I hope the special counsel will complete his work and report to the American people. So what do you think the president is up to when he puts out a tweet saying that this memo vindicates him and obviates the need for any investigation? Yeah, I think a couple things. And, you know, if I could take 30 seconds to review something that you said for more than a year, we had collusion, conspiracy, you know, people were accused of treason, and no one is making that accusation anymore, at least no one's serious. Even Dianne Feinstein has said there's no evidence of collusion, and I think that's the point the president is making. The, the essence of this memo is something quite different. And again, Chris, it's as you said, Hillary Clinton and the DNC hired Fusion GPS, who then hired, ironically, a foreign agent to create this dossier that we know is just political garbage. It's no more credible than a $2 novel. And the FBI used that dossier to survey a private U.S. citizen who had no accusations against him except for he had associations with the Trump campaign. Uh, it's, an, it's an absolute abuse of power, and we just want the American people to know that. All right. We're going to get into the memo in a minute. I want to uh, talk and turn to Congressman Swalwell about... So... That was, you notice how Chris Wallace started that clip saying hello again. Well, that was the very beginning of the show. So I don't know why he's saying hello again, but it was because of their technical difficulties. Like I said, I can't fault them for having technical difficulties, given that the first half hour of this show, like, did not get broadcast in anywhere, really. Uh, I mean, I'll, if you're watching this as a recorded show, hopefully you'll be able to see it without too many glitches. I don't know. Sometimes when the stream isn't working, the recording doesn't get some glitches in it too I, we'll see after we're done but uh so i can't fault the glitches on fox news sunday but they then uh did not really give the uh democratic position very strongly or you know as any of the other news summaries i showed uh they gave the republican position but then they also gave the democratic response uh you saw there that the first few minutes of Fox News Sunday, there was you know, basically no summary of the Democratic position. They did have Eric Swalwell on, and I'm not going to show any clips of him, but, uh, I mean, he did, did a good job, uh, but was kind of uh, out, uh, uh, especially if you include all the uh, Fox News panel discussion, uh, there was much less Democratic response on Fox News Sunday uh, then there was the Republican talking points, although you did see there that uh, Chris Stewart, that uh, member of Congress, did say that this memo doesn't in any way impugn the Mueller investigation, which seems to be what everybody was saying other than Donald Trump, as you saw in that tweet. And that same tweet where Donald Trump says he's vindicated was the basis of the uh, first question for Adam Schiff, the Democratic uh, ranking a uh, Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee uh, who has read, like I said earlier, has read all the underlying documents. Uh, and I'm going to show you two clips of his interview with uh, George Stephanopoulos. Uh, here's the first one 
in which uh, at first first he's reacting to Donald Trump's uh, tweet, and then there's a little bit of a follow-up that I will discuss with you after we watch that clip together here. I want to begin with President Trump's tweet uh, from yesterday. Put it up on screen there. He says the memo totally vindicates Trump in probe, but the Russia witch hunt goes on and on. There was no collusion. There was no obstruction. The word now used because after one year of looking endlessly and finding nothing, collusion is dead. This is an American disgrace. The memo vindicates Trump? Of course, not at all. And in fact, uh, on the issue of collusion, what the memo indicates is the investigation didn't begin with Carter Page. It actually began with George Papadopoulos, someone who was a foreign policy advisor for candidate Trump, uh, and someone who was meeting secretly with the Russians and talking about the stolen Clinton emails. Uh, so quite to the contrary, even this very flawed memo uh, demonstrates what the origin of the investigation was, and that origin involved the issue of collusion. And, and that's one of the problems you've pointed out with the memo. I want to dig into some of the other ones uh, that have been raised. Number one, the memo says that the FISA court should have been told that the dossier was financed by Democrats and Hillary Clinton's campaign. That's relevant information, isn't it? It is relevant information. FISA court, is there a political motivation? Was there a political actor involved? Uh, and the court was notified a political actor was involved, and that's part of the misleading nature of the FISA application. In terms of the identity of the political actor, the most important information for the court is what did Christopher Steele know? Uh, and Glenn Simpson has testified that Christopher Steele was uh, not told the identity of the lawyer or the party behind the lawyer. That's the most important information evaluating Christopher Steele's bias. But, but you're saying the court was told that the dossier was funded by a political actor? Uh, yes, that there was a political actor behind it. And this is, again, part of the misleading character of this document. Uh, and George, I want to, you know, uh, comment on this claim by my Republican colleagues that this is oversight. They're just doing this as a matter of oversight and asking these questions about why wasn't this included. If this was oversight, the committee members would want to read the underlying documents. I made a motion to allow them to read the documents. They voted it down. I made a motion to bring the FBI in and ask the FBI these questions. You know, why was this included? Why was that not included? That's what oversight looks like. That's the oversight we've done for You've 10 years. You've read the underlying documents. I have, and they voted that down. They voted against hearing from the FBI. When you do oversight, you haul them in under oath. You say, why was this included? Why was that included? The interest wasn't oversight. The interest was a political hit job on the FBI in the service of the president. They also point out in the memo. <laughs> so that's Adam Schiff. Uh, and I think he's giving, as usual, the strongest Democratic argument as to why this memo is flawed and uh, I, I think especially the the biggest bone of contention is whether the uh, application for the FISA warrants against Carter Page whether the judges were informed about the bias the, the so-called bias of the uh, Christopher Steele dossier uh, that it was funded by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, and there was actually apparently a footnote said that it was funded by... It didn't name the candidate or the party, but said that there was partisan funding uh, for the Steele dossier, and uh, that, like, the whether it's named or unnamed, that's kind of splitting hairs, I think, but... Uh, the the question is whether Andrew McCabe actually testified that uh, the Steele dossier was the basis for these warrants, and that's also another bone of contention between the Democrats and the Republicans. And here's uh, Adam Schiff talking to George Stephanopoulos about that in the second Adam Schiff clip I want to show on the memo release topic over here. In the memo, a quote from Andrew McCabe, the former deputy director of the FBI, who they say said no surveillance warrant would have been sought from the FISA court without the Steele dossier information. I know you've said, McCabe, here's how Chairman Nunez responded on Fox. What he said, uh, not to mention we have other witnesses who said uh, very similar things. Is it true that the FBI led the FISA application with the dossier? Yeah, most of the, uh, the the largest percentage of the of the entire application has to do with the dossier, and then using the news story to corroborate the dossier. Your response to the chairman? Well, the chairman is wrong. Uh, now, the chairman also hasn't read the underlying materials, but for example, 
The argument that the Yahoo News uh, article was circular reporting because it was based on something Christopher Steele said, that's not what the article was cited for. And if you read the application, you would know that's not what the article was cited for. But the whole point here is not to be accurate. Uh, the point is to be misleading. Um, the truly interested in getting to the truth, uh, that's not Use. Instead, they used a vehicle that has never been used before in the history of the House uh, to release this very one-sided memorandum. Uh, in terms of uh, Andy McCabe, like the memorandum itself, they cherry-pick uh, selectively in what he said. Now, while I can't go into the specifics of his testimony, I can tell you what he said was that you have to look at a FISA application as a cohesive whole. All the parts are important. Uh, and the suggestion that the chairman makes there and others on the committee have made also that the entire dossier was included in this is just plain false. You're responsible for oversight as well. Did the FBI make any mistakes here? Uh, well, we don't know because we haven't had the opportunity to bring I uh, in before the committee and ask him these questions, which in a normal process uh, we would have the opportunity to do. But the goal here really isn't to find out the answers from the FBI. Uh, the goal here is to undermine the FBI, discredit the FBI, discredit the Mueller investigation, uh, do the president's bidding. Uh, from the midnight run the chairman made to the White House to present documents he'd actually gotten from the White House to today, it's all part of the same. And indeed, the chairman wouldn't answer the question about whether his staff was working with the White House on this memorandum. Uh, so this is, I Inside think... Inside the committee, he answered on Fox and said there was no working with the White House. Well, uh, there's a reason I think he wouldn't answer that question in committee. And, uh, and the reality so is... So you believe that he, his staff worked with the White House? I think it's very possible his staff worked with the White House uh, and coordinated the whole effort with the White House um, because it looks so much like this earlier effort, which we know was coordinated with the White House uh, by the same chairman uh, who had said that he would recuse himself, but, but of course hasn't. Do you think this memo could be part of an obstruction? Hmm. So that's the second Adam Schiff clip, and uh, he has, like I said, read the underlying documents, and so he, his criticisms of Devin Nunes, who hasn't read the underlying documents, uh, probably has merit, and uh, there's this, if you, like uh, I said earlier, you can read the entire four-page memo, your, memo yourself at a link I put down in the video description, and there's this one uh, sentence in there where they say Andrew McCabe testified that the uh, Steele dossier was uh, necessary for getting the warrants, but apparently it was necessary. Th it was it was like uh, necessary but not sufficient. Like neither part was necessary or was sufficient alone. So and the McCabe, uh, I'm sorry, the Steele dossier has a lot of information in it that has been verified, even though there's the unverified salacious parts, you know, the PP tape and all that. Uh, but uh, having shown the two Adam Schiff clips and his criticism of Devin Nunes, who hasn't read the memo, uh, or hasn't read the documents on which the memo is based, I should say, uh, I now want to show two clips from Republican Trey Gowdy, who's retiring from the House of Representatives after being in charge of the Benghazi investigation for all those years. He's now saying, you know, he sees too many sides of issues. He's not partisan enough to really be a, a good legislator. And I'm not showing you that clip. That was just, uh, it's not on the topic and it was incredibly bogus. Uh, but uh, he at least did back up basically what uh, you heard Representative Chris Stewart say over on Fox News Sunday earlier uh, when asked whether Trump is correct that the this memo that was released vindicates Donald Trump in the Russia investigation. Uh, no, he, he this has nothing to do with the Russia investigation. And uh, I will show you that uh, first one minute trade Gowdy clip from CBS's Face the Nation over here. Saturday, President Trump tweeted that the memo, quote, totally vindicated Trump in the Russia probe. We sat down earlier with South Carolina Congressman Trey Gowdy, a key House intelligence investigator, and asked him if he thought the president had been vindicated. I actually don't think it has any impact on the Russia probe for this reason. The memo has no impact on the Russia probe. No, not, not to me it doesn't, and I was pretty integrally involved in the drafting of it. 
Uh, there is a Russia investigation without a dossier. So to the extent the memo deals with the dossier and the FISA process, the dossier has nothing to do with the meeting at Trump Tower. The dossier has nothing to do with an email sent by Cambridge Analytica. The dossier really has nothing to do with George Papadopoulos' meeting in Great Britain. Um, it also doesn't have anything to do with the obstruction of justice. So there's going to be a Russia probe even without a dossier. Speaker Ryan says that the memo that you helped put together here. So uh, that's the good part of what Trey Gowdy said, uh, where he actually was being somewhat fair. And you heard uh, Representative Chris Stewart say the same thing earlier that this and anyone who can read, you know, like I said, you can read the four page memo yourself uh, at a link I put down in the video description. And there's no way that this vindicates Donald Trump. It has almost nothing to do with the Robert Mueller probe and uh, the, you know, uh, Michael Flynn uh, pleading guilty, George Papadopoulos pleading guilty, uh, Paul Manafort, and uh, what's his, uh, I can never remember the name of his aide, who was the fourth, uh, the other guy who was indicted. It's not Rick James, it's Rick something, but... Um, Rick James. No, I'm thinking of the Dave Chappelle thing. But anyway, um, it's Rick somebody. But anyway, uh, who apparently might be flipping. And um, I, I'm really bad at remembering names. But the Paul Manafort's aide may actually has like is going to change lawyers. Was reported this week, and so he might actually be flipping and uh, cooperating with prosecutors. Uh, which uh, I've seen reported and that uh, jibes with what I know based on my experience as a criminal defense, uh, criminal defense attorney years ago. And uh, I actually want to bring up my experience as a criminal defense attorney after I show you this next clip. This is a four and a half minute uh, segment of Trey Gowdy talking about what's left out of the memo. And he says a, a I mean, some of the stuff he says in here is fair, but some of it is kind of bogus. Like, he, at one point he says, well, you know, if uh, the judges had been told about the political bias of uh, Christopher Steele, would they, you know, is, is the FISA warrant still good? And, well, you know, we'll never know. We'll never know, he says in this. And, you know, I actually did motions to suppress against warrants, which I'll talk about after we watch this clip. And uh, then he also talks about this footnote that he doesn't think was phrased properly for the judges, which is also kind of bogus, which I will talk about with you after we watch a minute clip of Trey Gowdy over here. That's the Steele dossier that you are pointing to there. But, but, but it's both the Steele dossier and who paid for it and whether or not it was vetted, but it's also what was not in it. This is an application to a court. So... I get that Adam Schiff and others are worried about what's not in my memo. Mm -hmm. I wish that they were equally concerned about what's not in the FISA application, which is a lot of really important information about the source and his subsources um, and the fact that he was hired by the DNC and the, and the Clinton campaign and the fact that he was biased against President Trump. That is all information that the, f that the finder of fact is entitled to. Now, we should dig into this because you are, from my understanding, the only Republican investigator on the House Intelligence Committee who actually viewed the FISA applications. Everything that went into is together this memo. So w when you're talking about this Steele memo, you are not saying that it was the sole piece of evidence used to justify these four authorizations of the surveillance warrant, are you? No. Um, it was not the exclusive information relied upon by, uh, by the FISA court. Would it, it have been authorized were not for that dossier? No, it would not have been. Um, and, How and can you say that? Because it was authorized four times by separate judges. Right, right? and the information was in there all four times. Mm -hmm. uh, and the judge doesn't do independent research. There are three Republicans that have seen every bit of information, three of us. Bob Goodlatte, the chairman of Judiciary, mm -hmm. Johnny Ratcliffe, who was a former terrorism prosecutor and a U.S. attorney in Texas, and me. All three of us have total confidence and DOJ to be able to do the jobs that they have been assigned. We have confidence in Bob Mueller, and we have serious consideration, serious concerns about this process. So we have all three of those things in common, including being concerned about what, what happened in 2016. Should all the information in the FISA applications be publicly disclosed, declassified, so that people can make their own judgment and see what you've seen? 
Um, I, I think um, I'm going to defer a little bit to the Bureau and DOJ on um, it's a long application. If there are sources and methods that are, are not already known mm -hmm. that they think would jeopardize national security, I would, um, I would defer to their judgment. The source that we revealed, uh, Chris Steele, was about the least well-kept secret in America. Mm -hmm. So I, I, generally, I, I err on the side of disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, there process um, is usually confidential, and uh, and I don't want to set the precedent of all FISA applications being publicly seen. Well, that's the concern in doing this memo, that you have set a new precedent. Um, I, I, I would argue that it's also um, somewhat unprecedented to rely on political opposition research to um, instruct and um, inform an application, and it's really uh, bad precedent and unprecedented uh, to not tell a court that a source has this level of bias. I mean, look, look at just the disclosure of who paid for it. They could have easily in Hillary Clinton. That would have been really easy. I read the footnote. I, I know exactly what the footnote says. Explained it the way they did, then if they just come right out and said, Hillary Clinton for America and DNC paid for it. But so, they didn't do that. But short of that disclosure, you still would have believed this FISA surveillance warrant was justified? I mean, it, your, your problem is in the disclosure within the application, but the surveillance itself of this American Carter Page was named in your memo, uh, who was at one point a Trump campaign associate. Uh, was that justified, that surveillance? Um, we'll never know, um, because the, the application contained three parts. It, became, uh, it uh, included the dossier, Mm -hmm. uh, it included uh, reference to a newspaper article, which, by the way, no court in America considers a newspaper article to be evidence. And it included other information they had on Carter Page. So what I would say to the FBI and DOJ is if you had enough on Carter Page with just him, why did you include something that the National Enquirer might not run? And why did you cite a newspaper article when there's no court in America that allows a newspaper article to be considered as evidence? If you had enough without it, why did you use it? That would be my question to them. Were the judges political? Now, actually, you can get a newspaper article into evidence in court if you uh, get the custodian of records or, I mean, there are various ways that, uh, for some facts, that you can get a newspaper article into evidence in court. So that's kind of bogus. Uh, it, I mean, not completely bogus because uh, it depends on whether it's hearsay and well. Whatever, but of course the whole uh, foreign intelligence surveillance court is kind of a bogus court because uh, it's a really one-sided court as it is, and uh, one of the things that's really bogus about this whole memo release and this whole concern about civil liberties from the Republicans all of a sudden that you know an American's civil liberties were violated because it's Donald Trump supposedly who civil liber or Carter Page his. Uh, campaign lackey or whatever Carter Pay I, was that his actual title campaign lackey I'm not sure but um, Carter Page was named as a foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump and he was being surveilled by the uh, based on this warrant at the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, which is a, a one-sided court where all of the uh, judges are appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who is a Republican appointee, John Roberts. Before that, it was uh, William Rehnquist. So they're all, like, appointed by an, a, pub, a Republican appointee. That So it's a very right-wing court to begin with, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And, uh, I mean, this whole argument is kind of bogus, but uh, I also thought that the, the idea that, you know, we'll never know whether the warrant would have been okay or not if the judge had known that it was Hillary Clinton and the DNC not whatever the footnote said which is like a you know partisan political you know I, I guess we'll have to wait for the Democratic memo, memo to come out to know exactly what that footnote says but uh, I saw one pundit say uh, on one of the shows in a clip I didn't take that you know, the, there was that whole unmasking scandal where they were complaining that they did say the names of actual U.S. persons. They unmasked the names of U.S. persons, and now they're actually complaining the opposite, that in this footnote 
the, the to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. They didn't say it was Hillary Clinton and the DNC that funded the Steele dossier. They only said some that you know was like some partisan political organization. And the thing is, Christopher Christopher Steele himself, the creator of the dossier, did not know who was funding his own research. So. Uh, it didn't really go to his own bias that it was Hillary Clinton and the DNC, but anyway, now I'm getting really deep into the weeds, as they say on the shows, and so now uh, I want to go to, uh, I have four more clips uh, to sort of clean the whole thing up. I have two from Dick Durbin, the uh, House Minority uh, Leader and uh, you know second in command of, for the Democrat, no, not Minority Leader, House Minority uh, whip Dick Durbin. Uh, the minority leader is Chuck Schumer. So Dick Durbin is the number two Democrat in the Senate. And uh, first, I want to show his uh, under one minute reaction to the Trump tweet claiming that the memo that was released on Friday, the four pages, you can read yourself that it vindicates Trump in the Mueller investigation. And uh, here's Dick Durbin's reaction to that. Over here. Thanks for joining us. President Trump says the Nunes memo totally vindicates Trump in the probe. Does it? No, of course it does not. And the fact that the Republicans in the House refused to allow a minority the Democratic response to their memo is an indication that this, they're just bound and determined to find ways to absolve this president from any responsibility. I agree completely with John McCain. It was John McCain who said trying to undermine the FBI and the Department of Justice uh, is really not in the best interests of America, and frankly it's doing Putin's work. We ought to be trying to focus on a, an investigation at a professional level by Bob Mueller and not uh, trying to find a way to obstruct justice or to absolve this president from any responsibility he has. I want you to take a listen to what the House Intelligence Committee chairman. Mm, so it's not just the Republicans, as you might imagine, who say that uh, this memo that was released from the House Intelligence Committee Republican uh, majority does not vindicate Donald Trump as his tweet claims. It's also Dick Durbin. The Democrat also says that, as you might imagine, he would. Uh, but uh, I also want to show this clip of Dick Durbin talking to Jake Tapper on CNN State of the Union, where he's talking about, uh, well, Jake Tapper talks about whether, uh, you know, what what would be the reaction if Donald Trump fired Robert Mueller or Rod Rosenstein, who supervises Robert Mueller, who's kind of impugned by this memo. And Rod Rosenstein is a Republican appointed by Trump. Uh, last week, actually, on my live clip roundup, I wasn't sure about that, but now you know, of course, I checked, and yes, Rod Rosenstein is a Republican. He was appointed by Donald Trump to be Deputy Attorney General. He, because uh, Jeff Sessions recused himself from the Russia investigation, Jeff Sessions, the uh, Attorney General, you know, former Alabama Senator, uh, recused himself, so that means Rod Rosenstein is in charge of the deputy attorney general is in charge of supervising Robert Mueller in his special uh, counsel investigation of the Russia collusion or obstruction of justice or whatever is going on. So if uh, Rod Rosenstein is fired, that means Trump gets to put in someone else, Rachel Brand, or maybe someone else to supervise Robert Mueller, not give him permission to you know, investigate anything new or maybe even, you know, Rob, uh, Rod Rosenstein or whoever uh, takes his place is the only person who can actually fire Robert Mueller. And so uh, here is Dick Durbin talking to Jake Tapper about what would happen if Trump fired Robert Mueller or Rod Rosenstein, but he doesn't really make a strong uh, you know, objection to the firing of Rod Rosenstein, which is a, a little disturbing given what I just explained, as I will discuss with you after we watch that clip together. Uh, oh, okay, after we watch that clip together, over here. 
I want to ask you it's about the fact that the president, as you alluded to, it seems pretty clear from the response of Trump and his allies uh, to the memo that it could, if not likely, will be used as pretext for the president to fire Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein or Special Counsel uh, Bob Mueller. What will you do if he does, if he carries out either one of those actions? Listen, this would be an extreme event and one that I say with some caution could create a constitutional crisis in this country. The question at that moment is whether or not the majority Republicans in the House and the Senate will stand up for the rule of law and the Constitution if the president takes that extreme position. Trey Gowdy, who is retiring from the House, a Republican, uh, conservative from South Carolina, said he saw nothing in this memo that undermined the investigation and he still had confidence in Bob Mueller. I hope people like Mr. Gowdy will continue to make those statements and stand behind the rule of law. If the president takes this uh, extreme action, this precipitate action, I'm afraid that it could uh, lead to a confrontation we do not need in America. But can you be more specific about what Democrats might do? Well, I can't, I don't want to predict that. I think that's too hypothetical. But we understand what the Constitution says we must do, and that is hold everyone in the United States, including the President of the United States, accountable if they have violated the law. No one, including the President, is above the law. Let's switch to immigration. The Democrats have been... So there you go. Dick Durbin, the number two Democrat in the Senate, saying that it would be a constitutional crisis if Robert Mueller is fired. But... Uh, not really picking up on the whole Rod Rosenstein part of it, which I think is almost as uh, dire as the firing of Robert Mueller, and that may be what the whole uh, uh, so-called Devin Nunes memo, even though Devin Nunes, it, I think it was, it's more like a Trey Gowdy memo since Devin Nunes hasn't even read the underlying information, but uh, whatever you want to call the memo, uh, the, the memo seems to be a basis for either firing Robert Mueller or firing uh, Rod Rosenstein, the number two uh, in the Justice Department, or maybe it's the reason that Andrew McCabe got fired or left early or, you know, there was a lot of sort of uh, opaque reporting on that because he was going to leave, but then he left early and so uh, maybe that's what uh, the memo was all about, but uh, I guess we'll find out. Maybe it's going to be the excuse why Donald Trump doesn't testify to Robert Mueller, which is something, and then Mueller will have to subpoena him, and I don't know. I, I, it's, it's kind of a mystery exactly what, whether this is supposed to, you know, muddy the waters enough so that Trump can, you know, keep his base and keep enough Republicans against uh, the Mueller investigation that uh, they, you know, that there's, he may, he can't get impeached or can't buy the Paul Ryan led Congress. But we'll see if the Democrats take over the Congress. So maybe he will, he will get impeached at that point, uh, you know, with the Democratic Congress in 2019. I've talked about that several times in the past, or maybe it's, he's just trying to keep enough of his base so that he can't get removed uh, even if the Democrats take over the Senate, it, if you uh, look at your constitution, here's my ACLU constitution that I always keep ha handy, uh, that, uh, you know, then it takes two thirds of the Senate to remove the president, even if he gets impeached by the House of Representatives. And that's never happened. And uh, so maybe this whole memo is just enough to make sure that there aren't two-thirds of the Senate to remove him from office. I don't know, but you can let me know what you think down in the comment section. Uh, I do have uh, two more clips I want to show you. The first one is the one I promised earlier. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of a vindication for Chris Wallace because he does ask uh, a more probing question of uh, the Republican member of Congress on the show, uh, Chris Stewart about uh, collusion, you know, the Republicans keep saying no evidence of collusion, no evidence of collusion, and you'll see Chris Stewart say that at the beginning of this clip, and then Chris Wallace actually lists a few things, not even everything that could be collusion, because it doesn't mention how Donald Trump, like, said, uh, like, publicly in his campaign speeches to, you know, Russia, if you have more Hillary emails, please release them. That's kind of like evidence of collusion, and 
Uh, there are multiple other instances of evidence of collusion that uh, Chris Wallace doesn't even mention, and he doesn't do a follow-up, so this is not a total vindication of Chris Wallace, uh, it, but at least there's, you know, a partial good question of uh, the Republican that I wanted to show from Fox News Sunday uh, in the clip I will watch with you over here. Mr. Swalwell, if you want to convince people, go convince your own Democratic allies. Go convince Dianne Feinstein. Go convince General Clapper and many others. They have said there's no evidence of collusion. It's not just the Republicans who are saying that. But uh, Congressman Stewart, I want to put up several things, uh, a, a full screen, because, and, and let's put it up on the screen right now, because some of the <clears throat> events have nothing to do with the Carter Page warrant, which again is why I wonder. Opolis being told by Russians months before that they had Hillary Clinton. The Trump Tower meeting between top aides and a Russian lawyer, General Michael Flynn, lying about his. Russian ambassador, you suggested at the beginning of this interview that you saw no evidence of collusion and no evidence of obstruction of justice, but you're focusing, I'm not saying it's not legitimate, we're going to talk about it, I promise after the, you answer this question, but you're focusing on what happened in the FISA court with regard to Carter Page. Yeah, because the American people didn't know about this. You knew about George Papadopoulos. You knew about uh, General Flynn. All of that had been already reported. This had not been reported, and we felt like, once again, the American people wanted to know. And, by the way, those things that you've talked about and the work of the special counsel, which, let me restate, I support and want him to continue, but none of that, virtually none of that, indicates any collusion on, on, the, on behalf of the Trump campaign and Russian officials. There just isn't anything. You've got some financial irregularities that happened years before the election. You've got some people in a process crime, as they call it, where they maybe weren't honest with the FBI. But no one has said or shown evidence of collusion between Trump officials and any Russian agents. There just simply isn't any. Well, let's talk about the memo <clears throat> and its central... And no follow-up there from Chris Wallace. Uh, you notice Chris Stewart, after hearing just a few of the pieces of evidence of collusion, or which is, or, you know, collusion is not a legal term, as I've discussed many times over the last uh, several months that this has come up. Uh, it the, There's no crime of collusion, but if you're talking about uh, Trump and the Trump campaign working with the Russians, there, you saw Chris Wallace bring up just a few of the pieces of evidence that that occurred, including that June 2016 meeting. That was like, uh, when I first heard about the possibility of collusion, I never thought there would be that meeting, and I never thought there would be the emails before that meeting talking about dirt on Hillary, and I mean, there's so much more evidence of collusion than I imagined But when this whole thing started, that uh, it, uh, though... Uh, you, sir, you, you saw there that uh, uh, the Republican, he all he did uh, after seeing the evidence was say, you know, virtually no evidence of collusion, and uh, that's kind of bogus, and there was really no follow-up from Chris Wallace there on Fox News Sunday, but uh, I do have one more clip I want to show you that shows uh, how someone who apparently he has gone through the process and already talked to the grand jury or Robert Mueller. This is former Trump chief of staff, Reince Priebus. In the final clip, well, I'm going to have a bonus Sandy clip afterwards that I took much earlier before I tried to start the show like eight hours ago. Now it's like 3.15 a.m. in the morning when I, and you can see, uh, well, if you're a live viewer, you can't see what's going on, but as, as a recorded viewer, uh, you will finally get the show uploaded sometime in a couple hours. But uh, before I get to that bonus Sandy clip for the fans out there, here's Reince Priebus, uh, who both, there's a Freudian slip in here. See if you can catch it. I'll tell you after I show the clip. Uh, and then there's also uh, this, uh, instead of talking about facts, he talks about, you know, I never felt anything nefarious was going on. He's trying to, he's obviously been lawyered up, as I think one of the pundits on NBC's Meet the Press said later, uh, where, 
you know, he's he's trying to show he never had the intent to commit a crime, even though all this stuff was going on, and maybe he knew about it, maybe he didn't know about it, but he never felt like anything nefarious. You know, in a earlier part of the interview, in a clip I didn't take, you know, he says, "I never felt like we were obstructing justice or colluding." Or here, you know, he never felt like anything nefarious was going on. In the final news clip for tonight, over here. <laughs> Like all of this, Chuck, and I can't get too much into it, and I've allowed some of this to go on just to, to, to be fair with you, but um, I never felt that I was involved in something nefarious uh, the whole way through, from the beginning to the end. So you can understand the frustration of the president when he's told he's not under investigation. Right. I think you know the story of Andrew McCabe that walked into my office, shut my door, and basically told me that the New York Times story that was in the paper that first came out in February that mm -hmm. said there are constant co constant contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russians mm -hmm. with the door closed looked at me and said I want you to know that this story right here mm -hmm. is total BS it's overstated and it's not true this is the deputy director of the FBI I didn't know who he was right. it's the middle of February and so Everyone's in, the, everyone's in this world where we're being told one thing and sort of operating in this other world of constant obsession by the media. I, I understand. Let me, one more question about okay. one, one more, more event. One more event that, we're, that has been unclear, which okay. is the Michael Flynn situation sure. and the issue with sanctions. We now know a little bit more. You had said at the time, you know, you had asked Mike Flynn, he did not, that he basically misled you and didn't tell you that his conversations with the Russian ambassador with that. You were the recipient of emails from KT McFarlane and, and forwarded emails, I think, from Tom Bossert during the transition that did hint that a conversation that, that Flynn had. Yeah. Now, it's very, no, it's very possible you didn't read these emails. Nobody knows. Did you know, when did you know that Michael Flynn did speak to the Russians about the sanctions issues? When did you find that out? Um, well, I can't really get into all of that. Uh, because some of that is is classified. Um, what I can tell you is that there was never a time from the moment that this issue came up until the moment that we discovered that it was. Um, there was never a time that Michael Flynn denied it. In other words, every time Michael Flynn was confronted with the question of did you or did you right. not talk about sanctions, he denied it. And he denied it over and over and over again. In fact, I want to point out that there is one, in fact, the president's lawyer said the following, this is in New York Times, that Mr. Cobb said that Mr. Trump did not know that Mr. Flynn had discussed sanctions with Mr. Kislyak in the call after the inauguration. He said, quote, Flynn specifically denied it to him in the presence of witnesses. Were you one of those witnesses? Were well, Flynn hit, denied uh, talking to the well, Russians uh, on sanctions and to the well, president? What do you mean? I, was a, I, was a, uh, I, I don't know, but not, I don't remember anything about in front of the president. But I can tell you, to me, certainly, mm -hmm. it was something that he always denied uh, up until the end. And here's the thing, Chuck. If, if, if General Flynn would have simply said, wait a second, you know what? I actually did. Or, hey, hold on. Maybe we did talk about this. Or, hey, don't you remember we had an email that may have hinted none of that happened because if it did happen then it would have simply been okay is what you did right or wrong okay if it's wrong what are we going to do about it is it something that we can correct we can what you're saying is you might have been willing to or, defend it or, or, or had say, he been forthcoming or say there was nothing wrong with it I mean we never got to that matrix because it was always a denial so it necessarily didn't have to get to the point of 12 denials all right um, and I've talked about this before I don't know where the 12 denials all of a sudden came from. Someone has obviously uh, studied the facts of this much more closely than uh, any of us have because he uh, has his, uh, the, he is in criminal jeopardy and has a lawyer who's uh, been coaching him on the facts, I guess. And uh, uh, even so, he still had that weird Freudian slip, did you catch it, where before saying that, uh, General Michael Flynn always denied that he talked about sanctions with the Russians. He first said that he never denied it. So, you know, he actually, I don't know, I, I guess it could just be a, a little slip, you know, real meaning to it. But you can let me know what you think down in the comment section. And, of course, I talked about before I showed the clip how he said, you know, he felt nothing nefarious was going on. And earlier he said, you know, I never felt like I was obstructing justice or that I was colluding, or, you know, he's trying to show that he never had 
uh, uh, corrupt intent, which is what a prosecutor would need to uh, charge him with most of those crimes. So uh, anyway, that's the last clip uh, I want to show you. And uh, I'm sorry to the live viewers who hung around and never really got a good live stream. I, I will be uploading this as a recorded show. Uh, and I also apologize if uh, I haven't been as uh, cogent as, well, am I usually that cogent? But not even as cogent as I usually am because it's like 3.23 a.m. as I'm wrapping this up. Sandy could not come here and watch the actual live show, but when I was first starting the show, like right at the end of the Super Bowl, uh, right around uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time, which was... Uh, like over eight hours ago, uh, I did try to get uh, Sandy to uh, lie down, uh, and she did lie down for the show, and I will, oh, and look, I have actually some, oh, maybe not, but uh, here is the bonus Sandy clip for the Sandy fans out there before I end the show over here. Ready for the show? Lie down. And you can see I even had to edit out like 10 seconds of that clip where Sandy was thinking about lying down. And I figured you didn't want to watch all that. Sandy is lying down in a bed like about 10 feet that way. But not here in the doorway where, this, where she usually sits and watch the show. And given that I did not have real live viewers, it was kind of a lonely show tonight. Hopefully next week Xfinity Confet... Comcast won't be uh, uh, throttling my upload speed for I did see a Xfinity truck down the street I don't know what is going on but I apologize to the live viewers and it's a big frustration for me hopefully next week I'll do the show at a more reasonable time and there won't be all these problems and until then or until I have some cause to upload some other video uh, I guess I will be seeing all of you around the internet.